Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. If nobody else prayed for you, who would you really want to have pray for you anyway? To me, it would have to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Who always gets his prayers answered? The Lord, right? Who always knows how to pray correctly? The Lord. Who knows how to pray directly and has continual intimate binding oneness that we can't even explain union with God the Father, Jesus Christ? We would want the Lord to pray for us. Now, most of us know what we've heard the term as the Lord's Prayer. And we immediately flip back into Matthew because teaches his disciples how to pray, and they call that the Lord's Prayer because the Lord's teaching the disciples how to pray. Technically, that's not the Lord's Prayer because he doesn't pray that prayer. He's teaching us to pray that prayer. The technical Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. And this prayer happens to be the longest recorded prayer that Jesus prayed in Scripture. There are many times he's connecting to God, and you see it. I gave you a few in one of the earlier outlines. But it's also the longest in time span because not only did he pray then as he's heading to the garden and finally to the passion, he was also connecting that prayer for us way into the future and uh, should he not come soon, although I believe he is, but should he not, he's still praying for the people yet to be born that believe on him, etc. So it's one of those long spanning prayers that goes on. And the beauty of it all is he didn't just park and pray at that one time and the prayer was ended. But after he died and rose again and he sits at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews says is that he's going to continue to make intercession, which is prayer. He continually prays for us every single day, and we desperately need it. And so that's a lot about this prayer right here. So we might say that's the bird's eye view of it. Now, to take you a little bit more into this bird's eye view, he just finished teaching 11 of his disciples. There was 12 at the beginning, one left to start this horrible time that Christ is going to go through, Judas Iscariot. So he's left with 11. He finished teaching, and while they're walking, he's praying. I believe he's talking to God the Father out loud. These guys are hearing him pray, and he really prays, and there's three compartments of this prayer actually in Scripture, three groups he's praying for. The first one he prays for, interestingly, is that he prays for himself that he would be glorified. And that's a very important part. I like looking at that because as he's getting ready to pray for someone else, he does pray for himself first, which tells me it is okay to pray for yourself. Although I don't think it's really great for us to pray, Lord, glorify me. You know, it's glorify the Lord. Then he prays for the next group, which would be those who are his 11 disciples. Now we know later on in the chapter, while he is praying for them specifically, and it's important for you to know why, he is praying for us as well as an extension. So he is going to pray for those in the future beyond the disciples, but he's praying for the disciples, but we're part of the disciples, so he is praying for us too. So there's kind of a connection that goes on. But when he prays for them, what an important prayer, because now he's moving it from Lord glorify me to Lord protect them. Last week, we learned that there are four key words there. He prayed that they would be kept, they would be guarded, they would be keeping kept, they would be kept again. So all the time, he's asking the Father that for the believers in Christ, especially his disciples at that time, that they would be secure in him. Now, I like that because, again, we're looking at it from a bird's eye view. He's left the teaching, he's now doing the praying, and he is facing this horrible kangaroo court, the horrible torture he'd go through, the time he'd be up on the cross, the moment that the father would be separated from the son, and then his final death where he willed himself to die. And he's praying for these guys because all that he is doing is called the gospel, and that gospel is to set people free from their sin and give them eternal life. And that message is what has been given to these guys to now take to a horrible, hostile world that we live in even today. And so he's praying that they would be kept. Now, what were they to be kept from? Two, they'd be kept from the world and not so much the earth as much, like landslides and fires and stuff like that, but they would be kept from the worldly influence of this godless system out there that leaves God totally out of the picture. And if they throw God in, they've so um, compromised God that he's not really God at all, okay? And they put it all together and he's saying, Lord, pray that they'd be protected. Now stay with me, folks. I know this is a lot of history and I'm going to try to make it real for you and me in just a moment. So he said, I'm praying that they would be protected from the world system that will come against them. 
Obviously, he knows how dastardly that world system is and how the pure system is the word of God, the gospel. But he also says, I want them to be protected from Satan, the evil one, because Satan can also come in. Now, while he's praying for him, part of the prayer is he prays, but he also provides the resources to be protected from Satan. Now, there was one who wasn't protected from Satan, and that person was Judas Iscariot, known as the son of perdition. Why is that important? Is that the Lord will only protect those who are by faith in him, blood-bought, born-again believers. He'll protect people like you and me that know we're going to have more part of his forever family. Those who are not part of his family, at least according to that verse, they're not protected. Now, some of you are hearing that and you're saying, oh, the Lord's going to protect me. Okay, that's good. That means no problems will come my way. Let me remind you of another person of God. His name was Job, and he went through the loss of his family, loss of his finances, loss of his fitness. He almost lost his wife. He had everything against him. And so you'd say, how in the world did the Lord protect him from Satan? He said to Satan, you can do anything you want to my servant Job, but you cannot take his life. In other words, that which would then cast him in forever, a lost eternity, could not do to Job. And so that means that no matter what we go through, as bad as it is, it could be worse, but the Lord protected you from that. Then you've got a, a guy who followed Christ in a major way, which would be Peter. And even then the Lord said, you will be sifted. Satan will sift you. In other words, Satan will affect you. But he will not own you. And so even then, he was protecting Peter. So whatever you're going through right now, you are still underneath the guarded hand of the protection of God the Father through the Son and his prayer for you then and even to today. And that's the kind of relationship I want to have with the Lord. That's the kind of, quote, religion, I don't like that word, that I want to have as one that loves me so much that he cares for me. So now, that's what we get. Now, why does he do that? Well, one of the reasons is so that we have the fullness of joy. I, I like that part. I like the fact that I know that he's working in my life, that no matter what kind of junk and whatever life throws at me, whatever happens in this life, no matter how far Satan might get to me, he can't get me, all right, I still can have the fullness of joy. I wish I had the time to parade people after people after people, person after person after person, who's gone through this kind of life, but all of it, they never gave up the faith. They never lost their joy. That doesn't mean that they're all happy through it all. But inside they had, watch this now, they had the sense of three things going on. They had the sense of joy because it was connected to peace, that it was connected to love. In other words, they knew somehow God loved them. They also knew that God, they had peace because God was large and in charge and near and dear. And because of that, the outlet would be if God loves me and I can have peace in him because I have peace with God and I can have the peace of God, then I can also have the joy that through all of this, as bad as earth gets, this is my hell because I'm going to heaven. And so you still have something to look forward to. The most beautiful thing is to talk to the husband of the wife who is in hospice that cannot communicate any longer. Her name is Joan. His name is Paul. And you know him well because we had him here about a month ago and honored him. And three days later, she crashed. So that being this, he is still saying, I miss my wife, stroking his wife, rubbing oil on his wife, caring for his wife, writing about his wife. But if you read his almost daily emails, there's a sense of joy because his wife is going to heaven. That's what we have as a result of Jesus praying for those that he is keeping because they are brought into his forever family by faith alone in him. Now, that's pretty much where we ended last week, but I want to give you one other little simple little outline as we're following this through, and then we're going to get right into this material, and we should be done about 2 o'clock today. I'm joking. I'll try to get it done quickly here. I wanted to give you three words. Last week, I started with the word eternity. So when he's praying about himself and he's praying for you and me, he talks about eternal life. And what is eternal life? That we may know God the Father, that we may know God the Son, because they are one. If we really intimately know him, that is eternal life. So he's talking about eternity. Now, how does that fit you and me who are going through life today with all the challenges that we have? It goes back to what I said about two minutes ago, that no matter what we go through here, we still face an eternity with Christ, with God forever and ever and that's the joy of it all. And watch this. It's not just fire insurance from hell and we get into heaven. It's like that I may know God, I may know the Son, that my eternity begins right now. People think, well, I get eternity when I die. I get salvation when I die. No, you got it right now. You have eternal life right now. And now you're developing a, 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 a growing intimacy with Christ today that you'll have a full explosion event in your life when you get to heaven. And that's what he provides for you. The second word is the word security. 
that once I've trusted Christ as Savior and I have that uh, uh, opportunity and privilege to be intimate with the Lord now and eternal, eternal life later on, I also am kept by the Lord. So I have security. Now keep that in mind. First eternity with the Lord. But that means it's eternity because I have security that's found in Christ. Remember the keeping part. I don't keep myself saved. He keeps me forever and ever, and he keeps me from the things that could steal my joy, steal my eternity, which would be the world and Satan. They both do numbers on my flesh that might cause me to do wild and crazy things, and it doesn't really matter. Now, the third word is the word unity, all right? But somewhere between the word security and unity, which means that we are all one in Christ, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, is another concept which is called maturity, where we are growing in maturity, if you recall, we talked about what are the four ways we answer God's prayers. Is Well, when we're bringing glory to the Lord, we're answering God's prayer because he prayed that he would be glorified in us, to them, to the Lord. And then secondly, we talked about how we could have security by being secure in him. And I know that I'm secure no matter what happens. I can rest on a promise of God. And now the new material I want to get into. So if you will, take out your notes. And let's kind of go through it pretty quickly right now because we don't have a lot of time. And where the answer to the prayer of the Lord is when we're growing in maturity. So would you follow along for me now? Look in the passage and let's look at it together. And we're, I'm going to pick it up at verse 16, but really it begins at verse 17. 16 kind of brings us into it. He says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So in other words, we're very much like Christ because we trusted Christ as Savior, that we have a home in heaven, we have God as our Father, etc. Now verse 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth, thy word is true. Look up here, if you will, for just a moment. <clears throat> the word sanctify is a word that in many religious and Christian realms it is now spoken about, but a lot of people scratch their head. When was the last time you even used the word sanctify when it wasn't a Sunday school class or a Bible study somewhere that you didn't have to use the word sanctify? We, we hardly ever use that. We hardly know what it means. Some people pack into the word sanctify. It means to be holy. It means to be pure and holy. Well, I do think that there is a part of this righteousness that we would have, but it actually means a little bit more than that. When we're sanctified, that means we're set apart. And some people say, okay, yeah, we're set apart for what? We're set apart for God. I, I get that too. But there's one other step. I'm set apart from something unto God for a particular purpose. That's what I want you to write down. When we're growing in maturity and we are sanctified, we're sanctified, set apart for God for a particular purpose. Now, let me see if I can use that word in an earthly way. All right, you see this pulpit up here? Some of you that are guests, you've been admiring it. You might be admiring it because of it's so big because you go to a church that has no pulpit or some little plastic thing. Some of you might be admiring it, which I like to admire because of the beautiful wood. You see this wood here? Do you know what that wood is? That's koa wood. Now, it'd be worth a gazillion dollars if it was all koa all the way through. I think it's laminated, but I'm not sure. It's koa. Now, here's what I would like to say. This piece of wood that's been constructed and, and made this way is set apart for a particular purpose. All right? It is not set apart for the purpose of firewood in the emu pit. It's not set apart for merely a dining room table. It's not set apart for me to hit with a hammer. It is set apart for primarily one purpose, and that is for me to put my Bible on it so I can look at it and raise my hands and often put notes on it so that I have it here in front of me. It's sanctified. It is set apart for a purpose. All of you sanctified your cars today. How many of you came in a car today? Raise your hand. That vehicle was set apart today to be used for you to be transported from your place of living all the way here to church. It had a purpose. You used it for that purpose, so that car was sanctified. Now, Christ is sanctified, and I'm sanctified. Christ is sanctified because Christ is God who has set apart God-man on this earth for the purpose of going to the cross to pay for our sins so that we then could have an eternal relationship with Him. He's sanctified. Then he says to us, he says, now I want them to be sanctified. Now we can't pay for our own sins. I can't pay for your sins. So I'm sanctified for something else. In the context, I'm now set apart by God for a purpose. And that purpose is very similar. To serve my God Father, like God the Son did his Father, for the purpose of taking Christ's life who is now inside of me and connecting to every people group. 
In fact, I like a new phrase I've been using, is that we are to take the Word of God and the Gospel into every person's world. I am set apart as a believer to do that. So whether you're a butcher, baker, or candlestick maker, however you're made as a Christian, you're to take, you're sanctified to go into that world that God has called you, your neighborhood, your club, your military career, whether you're playing a ball game, whether you're at school, whether you're at home, wherever you go, you are set apart for a purpose. So we call that maturity, and we do it together, and we call that unity. Let's go back to the passage. I love it here. It says, sanctify them in the truth. What do you mean, in the truth? Verse 17 goes on to say, your word is truth. Oh, my friend, what a beautiful phrase. Your word is truth. So we are set apart, sanctified, sanctified for a particular purpose, and we're doing this because of the word of God, which is known as the truth. Oh, So how does he sanctify us? Well, we put down here that it's because of the truth and it's because of the word. So <clears throat> how many of you begun to ask yourself, what on earth am I here for? In other words, why did God make me? Why am I in Hawaii? Why do I have this career? You're kind of feeling kind of like lost. You're kind of like floating. You're kind of like, I'm just going through the motions. It could be because we haven't really connected to the purpose God made you and for you and me to discover what that is and then to do it no matter the cost. Let me ramp it up just a little bit. Some of you are getting to a point in your life where you're going to retire from military, you're going to retire from your career. You look at Carol and me, we're at a certain age. We still think we have a lot of life and future in us, and I hope we do. But there may be coming time that I'm not as effective or ineffective in my uh, official continual role as, as senior pastor to such a great group of people. I don't know when that'll be. I hope it's a million years away, but it may not be. I'm going to have to be thinking what I do next. Now, why am I telling you that because we're all going through this? Is because... God says, I am set apart for a purpose. He says, then sanctify them. Thy word is truth. The more I immerse myself in God's word, the more that the spirit of God can take the word of God to reveal to the child of God what my purpose is for the glory of God. Did you catch that? Once I understand the word of God, that the spirit of God takes to the child of God, I then will know what my purpose is for the glory of God. That's why from the pulpit to small group ministries to my whole life, I bleed, get into the word of God and know it. Begin to strategize your time to get this book and know it. Yeah, you need to read it, but you need to study it too and deeply study it. You need to meditate and memorize this word. You need to apply it. We all do. And when we do, something mystical and magical, I hate to use that word, begins to happen. Doors begin to close. Things we thought we'd want to do begins to close. We, we, they're not opening. They're not open. It's not happening. Because God says that's not the direction. So he begins to open up other doors. And that's why we say to the Lord, Lord, I'm nothing more than a pawn on your chessboard of a game that you're winning. And now take me and place me wherever you need me to be. And if it means sacrificing me in the game, it doesn't mean that I go to hell. It just means that I fit a greater purpose for him. Now, this is so, you think this is hard preaching. This is hard hearing as well. And so I hope that each one of us would grab a hold of this book right here and he says, sanctify them. Thy word is truth. Get to know the word. That's how we begin the maturation process. How beautiful it is. Well, now verse 18, because notice how sanctification and maybe we could call it world evangelism go together. At least the concept of making Jesus famous on the world, in the world goes like this in the next verse. He says this, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Would you like to have an interesting discussion with your study buddy, prayer partner, mate, kids, parents? Ask this question. It says, as he was sent into the world, and here's the question. Why was Jesus sent into this world? Now, don't reduce it to some little quippy little answer that you can answer in the time it takes you to eat a french fry. Go a little bit deeper. Why Why was he sent to this earth? And then try to support it with much scripture as you can. Then take that worm's eye view of all those little verses, put them together. Then step back to a bird's eye view and watch how each one of the pieces of the puzzle put together. And you're going to see a huge bunch of reasons that all tie into a beautiful picture of as God was sent into the world. Jesus was sent into the world. Now, once I understand that, then I'll remember what he says in his prayer here. As I was sent into the world, so send I you into the world. Let me give you just some to play with. He was sent into the world, and in the world, what did he do? He showed that he obeyed the Father. 
All right, as he was sent into the world to manifest his obedience to the Father, I'm going to show my manifestation of the Lord by being obedient to my heavenly Father. As he was the one who made himself of no reputation, I'm going to make myself of no reputation. I'm not going to try to protect my reputation. I'm not going to try to make myself be famous. I'm not going to try to mess up my reputation. I'm just going to be as godly as I can be and let that be the reputation, but I'm not going to go around trying to protect it. Made myself of no reputation. Then I became a servant. Now, who am I going to serve? I'm going to serve the Lord, but I serve the Lord by serving the people that the Lord serves, which would be you and me. I need to serve you guys. I need to serve my neighbors. I need to serve others. So take this as far as you can. Let this just go with you. And then say, okay, I got it up here, but now do I have it here? And is it coming out here? My hands. That's how all this sanctification comes. Sanctify them. Thy word is true. Then he says, as the Father sends me. So a lot of this knowing the word is not just getting head knowledge. It's getting some uh, spiritual ministry work experience. And that's all part of maturation. And he's praying that for those guys. And he prays it for us by extension. How important that is. Go to verse 19. He says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself. You might say, well, wait, how how can I make myself pure and holy? You can't. He was already pure and holy. He can't make himself pure and holy. But he can say, I've been set apart for a purpose. And if you go back to the beginning of the chapters to glorify the Lord, I set myself for a purpose that God made me for. Holiness is certainly very much a part of it, and he was. That they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. So he's saying, I was set apart ultimately to go to the cross. And by me going to the cross, now they're set apart with a purpose too. And they live, boy, did this get heavy. This means you live, you and I live a cross-like life. While it's a Christ-like life, it's a cross-like life, which is a total surrender, a total slave, slave, slavership, if I can use that word, to the Lord. No matter what, whatever the price, for the greater good of bringing glory to the Lord by taking the message of Christ, who he is, what he's done to this world. Boy, this is certainly not a sermon on how to get out of debt, you know, is it? But it is a sermon from God's Word revealing the kind of prayer that God prayed for through Christ. Now, I love this because he didn't pray that the guys would get a job, that they'd find a nice house to live in, that they'd get a car that would run or a chariot that would work and the wheels would stay on. He didn't pray for any of that. He prayed for a deeper understanding that they would know, first of all, they'd be protected from all this stuff out there, that they would really know him through maturation, being set apart because of the truth, and now they would live that out with the world. Now, that's the kind of prayer. So it doesn't matter what kind of car you have necessarily or the house you live in or the neighbors that you have. It's that, it's that we live this life of Christ that he prayed for us. I think one of the greatest signs of a maturity of a Christian, this is Ponzism, but I think I can support it with Scripture, is going to be not, Lord, merely deliver me from cancer, but, Lord, bring it all on that you want, and now I ask you to help me to glorify you, whatever I have, with a spirit of joy and with other people and their spiritual needs in mind. Can you imagine? Jesus prayed that for the 11 because he knew that these guys are going to face hell on earth. And then he prayed for us the same prayer, essentially, because he knew we would face hell on earth. And I'm going to tell you, when the world looks at that kind of a Christian, they will say that we're nuts. But inside they're saying, I wish I had that peace. I wish I had that joy. I wish I'd know how to experience that kind of love. And I'm going to tell you, that's what turned the world upside down in the book of Acts. Because these guys were the answer to Christ's prayer. And I think we can be the answer to Christ's prayer as well. Well, let me go a little bit further here. We talked about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That's how we're sanctified. And that's a little bit more about what sanctification means. He went to the cross. He set himself apart for a purpose. Now, verse 20. He says, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, that would be the 11 that he just prayed for that were there. He says, but for those also. Underline that phrase, but for those also. That's why specifically for the 11, but by extension he's referring to us, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Now, you might say, well, it's God's word. Well, yeah, it is, but watch up here. Their word is impotent without God's word that's all-powerful. So it is their word, but it's really their word that's God's word that's speaking to them. And that's why he could say, they're not, the, the people aren't going to hear my voice, it's, Jesus is implying. They're not going to hear my word through my lips. So they're going to have to give their word, but their word is going to be our word. So when I'm up here, um, yeah, you're listening to my sermon. I get that. But to the degree that I'm going to be saturated with God's word and teach it accurately to you, it's really my sermon, but it's really God's word. If you're trying to, it, it's, 
I hope you're catching what we're trying to say there. I think you are. So that's what he's saying. So for those who will believe in me through their word. Then it says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. There's a lot of discussion about denominations and, and all of this and what about that and, and, and this, this kind of stuff. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my opinion here because we've got a little bit of time and I can close here an appropriate amount. Um, I, get, I get that there are different denominations and I get that there are Christians in other denominations. I will not say um, Baptists are all Christians. I won't say Methodists are all Christians. I won't even say independent Bible people are all Christians. What I will say, all those who believe in Jesus Christ by faith alone, in Christ alone, have eternal life. I will say that's a Christian. He may be a Christian who's a part of the Baptist group or the Methodist group. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.